So that's kind of the skeleton of this proof, but maybe you found that sort of illustration or that logic unconvincing. It was just looking at a single or a couple of examples after all. So how do I prove this uh, sort of, I guess we would say exhaustively. That's actually the technical name for this. What I'm going to show you is proof by exhaustion. Um, that's the technical title for it, but it does sound uh, a bit funny. It's like, I'm just going to prove it by doing something that makes me tired. Uh, it's also called proof by cases or proof by case analysis. Uh, what we're going to try and do is take an infinite set of possibilities. A could be anything, and we're going to boil it down to a finite set of cases that cover all of these infinite possibilities. So, hold on to your hats, here's how we're going to prove this rigorously, right? Firstly, uh, let's actually put the spotlight on this number A that we're actually including in our expression A cubed minus A, and also writing it as A minus one A a plus one, product of three consecutive integers. What I can say is to prove, uh, let's, do the, let's do the multiple of two part first, right? To prove that a cubed minus a has to be divisible by two, uh, what I can do is I can consider all the possibilities for a when it comes to, you know, being a factor, sorry, a multiple of two, whether it's divisible by two or not. Now we actually have a special name for this. It's either it's odd, which means it's not a multiple of two, or it's even, which means it is a multiple of two. So what I can say is, since a is an integer, a is going to be either even or odd. So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm taking all those infinite possibilities, a could be any integer, and I'm boiling it down to a finite set of cases, even odd, there's only two that I need to worry about. So let's suppose we uh, think about what happens if A is even, what can that tell us? Well, what it means is that I can write A in a particular form. I can say, well, I could write A as two times some integer, right? Where K is an integer. If you wanted, you could use this other notation that we've seen already. Let's put it in, um, I'll put it in in gray just underneath here, I could say there exists some value of k such that a is equal to double that value of k. So these two, these two statements here um, are logically equivalent. I'm just going to go with this because it's kind of the way my brain works, right? If a is even, I can write it in this particular way. So what can I then say? What does that imply if I can write uh, a as an even number? 2k, what does that imply about a cubed minus a? Well, I can say a cubed minus a, I can write it as uh, this product of three consecutive integers, a minus one, a, a plus one. But instead of writing a's, I'm going to substitute them for, for 2k's and see what happens. So if I put in, let's have a go, uh, 2k minus one, 2k, 2k plus one. Now, what I'm trying to prove, what I'm setting out to prove is that uh, a cubed minus a will be even, but that's quite easy to demonstrate by just taking out a factor of two. That's what it means for a number to be even. So I'm just gonna leave everything else in the brackets. I've got that 2k minus one. Here is where I pulled out that two from, which I've now put out the front, so this just becomes k. And then I'm left with 2k plus one. No matter what value of k you substitute into here, you're gonna get something in here, and then you're gonna multiply by two. So therefore, if a is even, a cubed minus a is also even. But of course, a might not be even. We're trying to say a could be any number. So I can say, or if a is not even, a will be odd. Now what this implies is that I have to write a in a different form. I would have to say a equals 2k plus one. Now, I don't have to introduce k again because I already did it uh, up the top here. So now I want to say, if that is true, if a is odd and it can be written in the form 2k plus one, what does that imply about a cubed minus a? So again, I'm gonna say a cubed minus a can be written as the sum of three consecutive integers, but I'm gonna substitute this uh, 2k plus one business. Okay, so watch what happens. Here's my 2k plus one minus one. That's the number before 2k plus one. Then there's 2k plus one. Then there's the next number, 2k plus one plus one again, right? So you can see um, there's here, 
uh, here and here that are making that substitution for A. Um, but fairly transparently, you're gonna get this canceling of plus one and minus one out the front. So I'm getting a, a 2K out the front. So in fact, I'm gonna write that as two and then do a big factorization, right? So there's a K and then I end up with 2K plus one uh, and then 2K plus two, those are the subsequent numbers. So again, I can factorize that out this two, which means that even if A is odd, I still end up with a cubed minus a being uh, an even number. So that's really handy. I can now say therefore, for all values of a, because I've covered exhaustively, this is why it's called proof by exhaustion, I've covered all of the cases, there's only two in this case. Um, I've covered the even case for a, covered the odd case. So now I can say for all values of a that are integers, um, a cubed minus a is divisible by two. So I've handled that part of things. In order to get to the end, I want a cubed minus a to also be divisible by three. Now, how do I go about this? Uh, I'm also going to reduce this to cases, but um, I, I sort of want to illustrate a little bit about where my cases come from. It's fairly obvious here when we talk about oddness and evenness, we deal with these quite frequently. Um, whether a number is odd or even, by the way, it's called parity. So because parity comes up so often, that's why we have these names, even and odd. We don't have names for you know, your either um, divisible by three or you're not divisible by three. And there are a few different cases in there that we need to actually treat. So here's the way we're gonna do this. We are now going to, I'm gonna use a different color to show my logic's going in a different direction. I'm now going to consider all of the elements of Z that we're interested in, right? Now I don't have to do this for all of them. I don't have to write down every element of Z that exists. I just have to think about, um, can I take all these infinite different possibilities and break them down to a finite set of cases? So let's think about this, right? I can say, uh, well, let's start from somewhere like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Let's go up a little bit. Uh, eight should do it. Okay. So let's think about this. How can I break this into a set of cases? Well, remember what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get at divisibility by three, right? So what I noticed first is that a series of the numbers, um, a set of the numbers, I should say, that um, I wrote down here in the elements of Z, they're just divisible by three from the outset, right? So for example, I mean, we normally think of the first multiple of three as three. So, oops, let's make that see through. Ta-da! So three is a multiple of three and it's not the only one I have. I've got six over here. Um, zero, strictly speaking, is also a multiple of three because it's three times zero. Uh, and then lastly, because we're including the integers here, negative three can also be classified as a multiple or if it's divisible by three. Now, um, here is one of my categories, right? Um, I can say that A could be one of these kinds of numbers, but this doesn't capture everything. So how do I capture additional ones? Well. I noticed that um, I can also say a series or a set of these um, numbers, a category, is the ones that are uh, above those multiples of three, just one bigger, right? You can see that a series of these numbers can be written as not a multiple of three, but one more than a multiple of three. Um, and you can probably see where my logic is now going to capture the entire infinite list. I can then say, well, if I include also numbers one less than a multiple of three, I now have, oops, there's eight as well, I have every single case covered, right? So these numbers here, which are multiples of three, I can write them in the form 3k, yeah? Uh, where k is my integer that I introduced before. I can say uh, that these numbers here, because they're all one more than a multiple of three, I can write them in the form 3k plus one. And then lastly, to round it out and make my list exhaustive, I can say that these numbers here are one less than a multiple of three, so I write them in the form 3k minus one. Here are my three cases. A has to be one of these, right? And if I can prove that you end up with uh, a multiple of three for a cubed minus a, regardless of which one of these three you start with, then I'll be done. Okay, so how do we go about this? Let's consider each of the cases. So I will say um, a can be written, I'm just setting out my cases here. A can be written as 3k minus one, 3k or 3k plus one, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, one at a time, right? If a equals 3k minus one, then what can I say about a cubed minus a? Well, I can write it in that form that I saw before. 
which is the product of three consecutive integers. So a minus one is gonna look like 3k minus one minus one. There's the first one. Then there's 3k minus one in the middle and then 3k minus one plus one. Okay, just to be really clear, what am I doing here? Um, there's my substitution once, twice, three times into the, the form that I can write a in that I know, I recognize. All right, uh, close that bracket there. All right, so now what can I say? Well, let's just tidy this up, right? I've got 3k minus two. I've got 3k minus one, nothing needs to be done to that. And then on the end here, I've got 3k. Well, what this shows is I can factorize three out of this, and that means that the whole thing, whatever comes after these brackets, in this case, it's 3k minus two, 3k minus one, and then just k. Whatever comes in here, I'm gonna multiply by three, so I'm divisible by three. Okay, great, now I need to rinse and repeat and just do it for the other cases. So if alternatively, A was not 3K minus one, it might be one of the three Ks, right? This one's even easier. I can just say A cubed minus A must therefore be um, 3K minus one, 3K, whoops, brackets going the wrong way, and 3K plus one. I don't even need to do any tidying up here. I just need to pull out the relevant factor of three um, and then write everything else afterwards. So that leaves me with a K and then 3k plus one. And by now you're like, oh, I can do this on autopilot, right? My final case is the 3k plus one case. So I'm gonna say for a cubed minus a, when I do my substitution, it's gonna give me, take a breath, 3k plus one, minus one, 3k plus one, and then 3k plus one, plus one. Uh, this will tidy up, leaves that three out the front, uh, big brackets, then there's the K, the plus one and minus one have canceled, and then I get 3K plus one, 3K plus two. So now, just like before, I have looked at every possibility for A, and they all end up with A cubed minus A being divisible by three. You can see it here, here, and here. So like before, I can say, therefore, for all the values of A that are integers, A cubed minus A, is divisible by three. Okay, happy times, I'm on the home stretch now. So, I want to prove that this whole thing, the, the divisibility by the two and the divisibility by three will land me with divisibility by six. Now you may be happy to accept that, but we can also prove it using some fairly straightforward algebra, right? Any number divisible by six can be written um, as, let's just say, 6k, right? But 6k, I can write that as a factorization, right? I can say, well, let's pull the two out. It's two times some number. Or alternatively, I can factorize out the three and say it's three times some number. So in other words, n being divisible by six means that I can write it as 6k. But you can see that necessarily means it has to be divisible by both two and three. So this is an if and only if statement. It's an equivalent statement. So n is divisible by two and it's also divisible by three at the same time. So this is it, right? I can say since uh, a cubed minus a is divisible by two and three, which I've proven above by exhaustion. Um, what that means is uh, it has to be, therefore, a cubed minus a has to be divisible by six as well, as required. Now, let's just take a breath and review what we've established, right? When you have a look at a question like this, a cubed minus a is divisible by six for all integer values, right? You wanna break this down into some bite-sized chunks because then you can take each piece and you can prove them one at a time and then they come together in this logical uh, conclusion when you combine everything. Um, it is worth noting that in order to say something and guarantee that it is true, sometimes you have to go through some slightly laborious uh, algebra, um, but I hope that you're convinced that this way of doing it, even though, like I said, I think it's probably about the same number of lines of working as proving this by induction 
using two proofs by induction. Um, the line of logic is much clearer. We kind of knew, um, even from this point here, when we had established that there was this divisibility, or sorry, rather that this there was this product of three consecutive integers, right? Once we got there, we had the guts of the proof and we just needed to go through each of the components. So I hope you found that helpful. Make sure you think about how you can break things down in a reasonable way. And sometimes it helps to you know, think of some actual cases because often your logic that you'll use for all cases becomes apparent when you do it for one or two cases.